Hey everyone, it's Rachel Rofe, and I'm here with James, otherwise known as Resale Renegade. And um, the way that I came across James is I posted, I don't know, about a week or two ago, that case study of how I was doing the um, Amazon fulfillment by Amazon. I made $1,000 my first month with an easel. And James commented on there that he's been cleaning up with FBA fulfillment by Amazon for a few years. So I asked if he'd be open to being interviewed. He said yes. And then I come to find out like he has all these videos, this awesome site with just so much knowledge and he's just so generous with all his information. I asked him if I could ask like all the juicy things, like how much he's making, where he sources his products, all that. He generously said yes to all of it. So this is going to be a great, great interview. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it. This is exciting. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm excited too. I think this is going to be great. Um, awesome. So I know I used to do a lot of um, the same kind of thing that you're talking about where um, going through your videos and stuff, you've been doing a lot of sourcing and then reselling and you do all kinds of sites like you're talking about Amazon, eBay, Etsy, all this stuff. I'd love to know like your story. How did you get started doing this? Uh, well, I actually got started a long time ago. Um, my, my oldest eBay account is from 1999. Mm. And so it, I was like a high school senior maybe when I got started. And I used to buy and sell cars, and I would do, I mean, I've always kind of gone to thrift stores and, and picked little things and that kind of stuff, and so when I would sell cars, I would also post other little things on eBay, and throughout the years, it's just kind of evolved from that, you know, like, it's always been something that I've done, no matter what else I'm doing, even if I had a job or anything, I've always done it, and it took me, God, too many years probably, to realize that I could just make a full-time living at it. And so once I realized it, it was pretty much non-stop from there. I just, I started branching out and testing some other sites and seeing what else, you know, was out there. And uh, it's just been pretty much history ever since. That's awesome. So, okay, so you source your products and then you sell them on, like, what sites do you sell them on? I sell, well, right now, I'm mostly selling on Amazon and Etsy. Um, I have, I, I went through a pretty major business restructure last August after a huge technical meltdown. I mean, my computer basically exploded, and it was horrible. Um, and I mean, I was left, like, not being able to fulfill orders on eBay, and I wasn't able to list things. And it got me to really thinking about how my business model was set up and the way that I was doing eBay. And it, it really ultimately what it boiled down to was that it required me to be present to make money. And that's not really what I was looking for. So after August, I kind of switched over to 100% Amazon or Etsy because I have a way of fulfilling orders on Etsy hands-off as well. And that's kind of what I'm pushing towards now. So for the most part right now, I just to make a very short answer long, um, Amazon and Etsy are pretty much my primary two. I am revisiting eBay with a different mindset and a different way of fulfilling items. Uh, but I'm just getting started back into the process now, and I'm not so much doing it like I used to. Yeah, that's awesome. I remember it from my eBay days. It can be a lot of back and forth to the post office and just really aggravating. Have you considered getting an assistant to go through and do all that stuff for you? I have. I have, uh, I have tried with four different people to bring oh. somebody on, and I cannot seem to find somebody who wants to work. <laughs> Uh, well, I kind of live out in the middle of nowhere, and so my my prospects are not that great. There's not a whole lot of people out here, really. And uh, so I've, I've been having trouble finding do what I want to do, you know, the shipping and the packing and all the mundane stuff. And uh, so I've just kind of, in the meantime, I let Amazon handle most of that stuff. Yeah, that's what I love about Amazon. That's what they are. <laughs> totally. They're amazing. So for everyone who doesn't know about the fulfillment by Amazon, basically you can just go through, send your items right to Amazon. They'll ship it for you. If you're like an Amazon Prime member, um, then they'll actually ship it to you within a day or two for free. So it's just, it's so much easier. No going back and forth to the mailbox or anything like that. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. I love time too. It's like the best thing ever. It's so good. It's such instant gratification. I can't wait till they get those robots and it's even faster. <laughs> the drones. <laughs> the drones, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So I know um, you've done all these different sites and stuff. What kind of products do you normally sell? I sell, well, I try to sell primarily new items. Um, brand new seems to just be the easiest for me because I don't 
have to take photos of it if it's brand new because your stock photo is pretty much floating around the internet somewhere or already on an Amazon listing, something like that. If I am selling a used product, I generally do snap a quick picture if it's something, you know, high enough value. But I don't want to sit, spend time doing that kind of stuff. So most of my products are new. Um, source them um, everywhere. I mean, I, get, I do retail arbitrage. I don't know if you know what retail arbitrage is. But basically, it's go to the store, you find something that's selling lower than it's selling on Amazon or wherever you want to sell it. And you buy it there, you sell it on Amazon. And you just collect the split. And I do a lot of that. And I also do a lot of liquidations. So, you know, re other resellers, I actually bought out seven different resellers last year mm. from businesses that were closing. You know, it was, it was somebody who had imported a bunch of product from China, maybe, or it was one guy was a sports memorabilia guy. And they just decided that they didn't want to do it anymore, so I bought their entire inventory. When I do that, I, I'm getting more into that. I'm actually working on a deal right now that's probably too big for my britches. Um, but it's this guy who's got all this I Love New York memorabilia that has been sitting in a storage container for six years. It's all brand new. It's all licensed. It's all got here. <laughs> and it's like 96,000 pieces. Wow. So way over my head on what I generally do. But go for the gusto, you know? Totally. May as well. Okay, so this leads me to like 500 different questions, so I'm going to try to go one at a time. <laughs> for the liquid, okay, so let's say for this example, for the I Love New York stuff, how do you know that it's going to sell at a profit? Like, because oh. I, I guess what I've learned so far is you, you look and you see what the sales rankings are for things, and then you sell what's already selling. But it sounds, I mean, I don't know that I Love New York actively sells, right? It's, well, that's the thing. You have to, the benefit of the business model is I use a, a program called Profit Bandit on my phone. Yeah. And I have, like, a Bluetooth, it looks like a little clicker thing. It's like a Bluetooth scanner. And so I just scan the barcodes, and it will pull up. If there's something already on Amazon, it'll just pull it up and tell me how much it's selling for, what the sales rank is. I can then click and look at Camel, 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 which is most odd site, but it tells you Amazon sales ranks and history and price history and that kind of stuff. And I can tell whether or not the item's going to sell and get a general idea for how much it's going to sell for. And once I do that, my starting price or my starting point, or I guess not my starting point, my maximum point that I want to be in on a product is about 30%. Because after Amazon takes their 30% and I pay my 30%, I want to be able to double my money. Doesn't always happen, but that's that's my general rule. That's where I want to be, and so that's how I kind of determine whether or not I'm going to buy a product. Is if I can get it for the right price, I can sell it, and that's kind of one of the things that I've learned throughout you know the last few years doing this. I can literally make money selling anything if you can get it for the right price. Yeah, and that's just I mean, pretty much back to life right there. That makes sense. Okay, and I love that Profit Bandit app, by the way. I use it all the time. It's such a good, great app. Oh. <laughs> um, so, okay, so you don't look at the bestseller ranking or anything. You just look at the price. And if you can make money on it, then you're not worried about how fast it'll sell? I, well, no, that's not necessarily true. I do look at the sales rank on it. And depending on the category, I have certain metrics that I kind of stick to. This looks just based on my experience, you know. And... Some people go a little higher, some people go a little lower, like for instance in toys, I'll buy anything with under 100000 in sales rank, and you know, assuming that, the, that I'm going to double my money anyway. And as it gets lower towards, you know, let's say the top 1000 or top 10000 I don't have to necessarily double my money because I know that that item will turn quicker, and I'll still see, receive the ROI, you know, back in my bank account maybe two, three weeks, four weeks, most. So I can afford to take a little less profit. So that's kind of how I judge. You know, if it's, if it's a really high rank, I have to make a lot of money. If it's a low rank, I can make a little less money because I know it's going to turn over fast. Okay, that makes sense. Now, for everyone who's watching, if you don't know about the bestseller rankings, basically if an item has the rank, let's say, number one, it means it's the best-selling product in that category. If it's, you know... 50,000 is the 50,000th best category. So he's saying that um, the more something sells, the faster it'll turn around, so you don't need as much of a profit margin. So then with the I Love New York stuff, that stuff does have a sales ranking then? Like it does sell, just much slower? 
I haven't gone through all of it yet, but I, it's pretty promising right now. From what I've seen, um, going through just like he sent me an itemized list of what he has, UPCs and that kind of stuff. So I've been copying, paste, copy, paste. It's been pretty tedious. But from what I'm seeing, it's actually doing all right. And it's something that I could sell on eBay even too because they're doing pretty good on eBay. Can I show Profit Bandit on this thing? Is there going to be any issues? Yeah, anything? I guess just hold it up to your webcam and it should be great. So that little yellow thing, that's the, the sales rank that I use. This particular item, I'm not probably going to buy um, because it's too low on the, on the dollar amount for FBA. Yeah. But that, that's the number that I use to tell whether or not I'm going to buy something. Like a 43,000 rank in tools is not really that great. Um, so it would have to be something that I would you know, double or triple my money on to sit there and, and afford to be able to wait. Because major, major pillar in this business is cash flow. You don't want to be sitting there with no money in your bank account because you're going to get something that comes along and you know, have the money to so I tend to have a quick rather than slow down. Totally. I'm glad you showed that. Thank you. Okay, so I just have a couple more questions on the liquidation piece, then we'll go back to the other <laughs> stuff. But with the liquidation, so where do you find these great deals? Because I, I never, I, I didn't know that you did that. Or maybe I did, but it didn't register. The, the liquidation is actually primarily referrals. Um, strangely enough, I get, like, I've got a buddy who just has connections with those guys, and he called me and turned me on to the first guy, and then that guy turned me on to, to another guy, and that guy, turned, it's, it's really built itself like that. It's very surprising to me that it has, but I guess, you know, all these resellers kind of get together, because I know a lot of other resellers myself, and if I were getting out of the game, I would probably sell my inventory to another reseller. And I guess that's maybe how it happens, but that's how I end up with the lead, is it's a phone call, hey, you interested in buying a pallet of this or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> what tell me more about it? <laughs> you know, and it's just that. Yeah, that actually makes sense, because when you were saying it, remind me, I have somebody who's selling a huge lot that I immediately wanted to refer you to. <laughs> so, oh, okay, yeah. totally. So, what kind of prices do you normally pay for when you're buying the lots, like, and for how many? And I realize that it varies, but if you have even just, like, maybe the last couple deals that you did? Um, it, it honestly truly depends, because I'll buy anything, well, obviously this is cash flow restricted, you know, I don't have $100,000 to just pop down on something. But, you know, like, any time that I'm able to buy a bulk lot of things, you can negotiate the price of it down because you're buying the entire lot. And ideally, for me, I want the lowest price that I can possibly afford, you know? And so if I, I mean, I've worked out creative deals on, in times, you know, that I can't afford the entire thing. I've done it on consignment. I hate doing consignment, but I'm not going to lose a deal over not being able to afford the whole thing, you know? And other times I've been able to split stuff up if I can't afford it. But as a general rule, I mean, I don't have this in my bank account right now, but I'm trying to establish a rolling cash flow of like $50,000 to just have at all times so that if something big comes around, I can just say, boom, let's do it. Um, it doesn't really work like that all the time. <laughs> you know, I mean, the other day, actually, I just I just spent $1,500 at the store the other day on on cameras and other like various electronics, which really doesn't get you that many cameras. Um, but the turnover on them will be super quick, so I can just throw all the money at it, flip it, and have my money back You're relatively fast. But I don't have to worry about you know the bank account being dry or anything like that. But it's, it's I mean, I guess I don't know if that answers your question. Or not. It's all over the map, really. I take it deal by deal basis. You know, if I need to, I'll go into a credit line to buy something. You know, I just make deals happen. Wow, that's confident. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's well, that's the thing about the business. If you can look at the metrics beforehand and you can say, okay, I'm pretty confident that I'll make double my money. Or even, even if I'm pretty confident I'll break even and it'll be fast. That's pretty low risk. You know, it's not like I'm just going out to, you know, the middle of nowhere with no internet connection and saying... Here's fifty grand for this, and I don't do fifty thousand dollars transactions. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just, you know, like I'm not just buying blind. I only buy things that I'm pretty sure are going to make me the money back. That makes sense. So, okay, so you mentioned the liquidations. Awesome. Uh, where else do you get your inventory? 
Uh, well, like I mentioned, I do a lot of retail arbitrage, uh, going to stores, big box stores, you know, Walmart, Target, various grocery stores even, and just scanning stuff, that kind of thing. When I find a good item, I buy it. And uh, that's actually, I do more of that than I do liquidations and wholesale because it's fun, I guess. I don't know why, because I could probably yeah, you set something up better if it was just wholesale, but it's fun. So I, really, it's like any store out there. I buy a lot from Target. Target, yeah. Let me just <laughs> double check her still. Okay, cool. Um, so Target's good. Have you gone to, one of my favorites is dollar stores. Do you ever do the dollar stores? Um, I do, actually. I buy, I, when you do Amazon FBA, you have to bag a lot of stuff. Yeah. Because, you know, any kind of children's toys with the openings or anything like that, you have to bag them. And so I actually get a lot of my poly bags from the dollar store because Dollar Tree has two and a half gallon bags and there's like six in the thing for a buck. And it's cheaper than you can even get poly bags on Amazon. <laughs> so I buy a lot. I, every time I go in there, I buy them out of stock. And while I'm in there, I look around for stuff. Um, and one thing that I've been doing with dollar stores, especially at Dollar Tree, Dollar General, that kind of stuff, um, is I buy, I make holiday bundles. Mm. And like for Easter, for example, Dollar Tree had a bunch of different types of candy, you know, that uh, that's not meltable. And uh, they had some egg coloring kits, and they had you know that kind of stuff. And I put all of that stuff together into a bundle. And I'm, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with it quite yet, but I'm going to make some sort of like a ready-made Easter basket, or I'm going to make like a candy bundle or a care package type deal. And I'm going to put that together on Amazon, and I buy my UPCs on eBay, so I take the UPC code, I stick it on there, and I put my Amazon FBA sticker, off it goes to Amazon, and then I market the product. That's awesome, because now you're getting people that are doing the searches for a specific candy that they want for Easter, but you're going to get them coming in all these different ways. I love that. That's really cool. And that's just really, one of the other questions I was going to ask you is kind of what you do for holidays, but it looks like like the bundles. Do you do anything else for any other holidays? or? Oh, I capitalize on holidays like crazy. Totally, yeah. Um, Oh, yeah, that's like, last year I did, um, I increased my business revenue by 15%, just on little micro holidays like St. Patrick's Day, Valentine's Day. I love the, you know, page, any reason to sell something, anytime you see a car dealership doing a commercial for a sale, it's a buying center, is what it is, and there's ways to capitalize on that in almost any business. So I take change from that, and I just create ways to make money with it. <laughs> so can you give an example maybe for St. Patrick's Day of something, or even Valentine's Day, because they've just passed, of something that you sold? Well, well St. Patrick's Day I did, um, well, actually, I'll back it up a little bit. When Christmas ended, I went into a couple dollar stores, and they had solid green and solid red tins. Um, and they were blowing them out, you know, just little candy tins or whatever. And, well, they are actually pretty big. And I bought the entire lot of every single solid color one that I found, because I didn't want any of this candy cane looking ones. And then I created little kits for Valentine's Day and St. Patrick's Day using the red and the green. And for Valentine's Day, I did like a little, um, like a romance kit. There was like some tea lights and there was some Valentine's. There was like this nice little card. And all these things that I sourced and I put them together into this little kit. And I called it a romance kit and I sold it on Amazon. It did pretty well. I didn't sell out of my entire stock, which I, you don't always, you know, you have to be pretty good about guessing what the sales volume is going to be on it. And then for St. Patrick's Day, I did a similar thing, only I did a, like, a hangover recovery slash drinking kit, because everybody likes mm -hmm. to party, you know, on St. Patrick's Day. And so I went to the dollar store, and the dollar store by my house actually has these great beer mugs. And, I mean, they're, like, pint beer mugs, and they're a buck a piece. So I bought a couple of those. I bought this product called NoHo. I put that together. I put some other stuff in there, and I packaged it as, like, a, I don't know, I'm drinking type thing, you know, hangover cure type deal. And that's what I'm, I've been selling for St. Patrick's Day. I've only sold two of them so far because it's kind of just starting to get ramped up. But that's that's the kind of stuff that I do. And then obviously I do the other little, you know, trinkets and all that kind of crap. If I can find them for low enough price and then mark them up. I love that. I love it so much because it's so fun. You get to be like a kid and create these kits, and oh, I love it. Just the yeah, art. that's the funnest part about it, just creating. <laughs> you know, you have to be creative. And that's one thing in this business, you really do have to be creative. Because if you're just going to 
I mean, anybody can go out there and make the money with Amazon FBA by finding what you're selling, or finding what is currently selling, and just selling the same thing. And you can do that, but I find that when you add a little bit of creativity into it, and you, you know, like, kind of personalize it and make it your own, for me, it, it becomes considerably more fun. And then I've got products that I have no competitors on, and... I can, as long as I can drive traffic to it, which you really don't even have to drive much traffic to it, you can sell products that you created with no competition, and I mean, what's wrong with that? That, that rocks. So, okay, so for the St. Patrick's one, for example, how much did, like, how much did it cost to create those materials, and how much are you selling it for? I think I'm in the those for, like, the number on top of my head is $4.58, but it, so it's like $5 ballpark, and it's, on um, when I have it on Amazon, it's it's fourteen ninety nine. So I'm I'm covering Amazon fees, and I'm I think I make like three dollars and sixty some odd cents for it. So it's not quite double my money, but that's just I mean I'm hoping to be able to sell quite a few of them. Totally, yeah, that makes and sense. The Valentine's Day was I think I had oh I don't want to say the wrong numbers here, but I think I had like seven or eight dollars into it. And I was selling them for twenty four ninety nine. Sweet, that's great. Yeah. Um, oh, but yeah, that's cool. And yeah, the dollar stores are so much stuff. I remember um, when I started doing the retail arbitrage, I kind of do it on and off. I got some really amazing sugar free candy from the candy aisle, and then um, that was like really big. It was a dollar general, a dollar tree, or whatever. There were pretty big margins there. And um, and Target you mentioned is also. Oh, yeah. I just love like walking the back of the aisles and looking at the clearance end caps. <laughs> There's such amazing stuff that you can buy there. They have such great deals, especially after the holidays when they do the slashes. I used to um, be a retail manager, so I so sometimes I, like I know that different departments are different days, so you can start to see if you go in the oh. early mornings, like <laughs> what the um, where the price change team where they are, and then whatever kind of you want to target, you can start going that day or the day after, whatever. Inside knowledge, right there. Inside knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to have, you know, because I do the same thing. I I have a route that I kind of hit, and I know the stores, you know, and I know a lot of the managers and stuff, and, and I get little tips. That's actually a tip. If you're going to be doing retail arbitrage, get in touch with, like, the inventory managers or the, you know, the staff that is doing inventory because they'll give you tips. They'll say, hey, we're marking this down next week. Don't buy it today. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, some people think, like, they're doing, a, like, they're shady or whatever going in, but a lot of the times, I know from my experience in retail, I'm like, thank God, take this clearance off our hands. Like, we have stuff in the back we need to get out, so please, anything yeah, you can do. And we need shelf space. Exactly. That's awesome. Okay. So, Target, dollar stores, do you ever um, find things online? Um, eh, I do a little bit. Most of what I do online... I do a lot of shopping online and then pick up in store if I can. So sometimes what I find is like if you're using sites like Slick Deals or you know One Sale Day that kind of stuff, or No More Rack or No Re Rack or whatever that site is now, um, it takes so long to get the product to you, and there's so many other people buying it that a lot of times the price will crash. Mm. So I don't really use like deal sites, but I do a lot of shopping online. So, like, let's say Toys R Us, right? I'll find a product that's cruising on Amazon, and I'll find it on Toys R Us for a third of the cost, because people, for some reason, don't price shop. I don't know why. <laughs> and it might not be available for purchase online. And so what I'll do is I'll see if there's in-store pickup. I'll look and check it stock and see if there's any stores around me that have it. I'll call them, you know, I'll do that kind of thing. I'll do the footwork before I actually just drive out there. And then... I'll have them waiting for me, and I'll buy 10 of them, or whatever, you know, whatever it is, like, based on sales, or something, that kind of stuff. That is so smart. I do a lot of shopping online, I just don't do a lot of buying online, I guess you say. Totally, okay, that's really smart. So, I'm curious now, um, like, do you have any that, when I ask you, like, what one of your biggest success story items was, do you have any that jumped to mind, something that you're just like, oh, you made such a great profit with? Um, I, I have two, actually, that... They're stupid, and they're actually not even Amazon products, but they're, they're, I think, the reason that I'm in business today. Um, my first big score was from a Savers in Arizona on Power and Baseline. If you're in Arizona, it's the Savers on Power and Baseline. <laughs> and uh, 
it was a Sigma lens. It was a 50 to 500 lens. They call it the Bigma. And it, this lens is like a $500 lens. And I got it for $8. And that was like one, that was one of my first like large scores on eBay that just like injected a bunch of cash into my ability to go back out and buy more stuff, you know. So that was that was probably and I mean that was years ago. So that was one of my first great scores. The uh, the second one that jumps to my mind is after I moved to New Jersey because I'm in New Jersey now. Um, I was I basically started with. Like nothing, because it costs almost everything to move here. I liquidated all of my inventory, that kind of stuff. I started basically back in zero. I've actually started this company four times oh over again. Um, because I I tend to risk a lot, and when those risks don't pay off, you know, I end up. Excuse me. But uh, there was this this tie clip that I bought for fifty cents, and it turned out to be eighteen karat gold, and it was heavy and fat. And I scrapped it to a refinery that I used, and I got about seven hundred dollars out of it. Wow! And that's that's what kicked me back off here in New Jersey, and I've managed to turn that into my empire today. Your empire. So we said actually we'd be juicy, and we'd tell people like, can you tell people how much you're making per month? And again, I know that it changes. Like quarter four, you're probably making a ton of money right before Christmas, and maybe after not as much. But that is like, true. Yeah. Quarter four is is a huge surge. January is called returnuary because everybody's returning stuff. You actually don't make hardly any money in January. I didn't do too bad this January actually. Um, as far as a monthly, see, it's kind of a trick question for me because I don't pull out money from my business unless I absolutely have to. So what, like last year, for instance, on my taxes, I might have only made like fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. But I also invested eighty thousand dollars into new inventory in my business last year too. So it's not necessarily like I I I think Gary Vaynerchuk is where I heard this. But the longer you can wait to take a paycheck from your company, the bigger your company, and the faster your company will grow. And that's kind of what what my plan is. So I only pull money that I absolutely need. So it's really hard to say how much I'm actually making per month. It just depends on what my bills are. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so let's say someone was not thinking long term like you. Do you, like you think something like five thousand dollars a month would be? Yeah. Like if you're if you're a hustler, you want to get out there and you want to do the work, and you aren't scared to spend money. That's that's the thing that holds most people back. They're scared to spend money because they don't know if they're getting it back. Maybe I'm not sure what stopped them. But if you're hustling and you want to get out there and you want to spend money and you have money to spend, 5000 a month is not out of the question. I'm a small fish in Amazon Pond. I mean, there are people that are doing millions of dollars per sale with two or three people. Or not per sale, per year, I'm sorry, in sale. With two or three people, you know. it's Amazon is a gigantic marketplace. And the advantage about Amazon is that you can sell the same product over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's scalable. So 5000 a month is not out of the question for somebody who has the money to invest in product and has the gumption to get out there and do it. Totally. Okay. And even you, like if you did 80000 in inventory last year, I guess assuming, I don't know. Well, that's what I put back into it. That's not counting what I have in stock. Oh, so then, yeah, so you've been making a pretty great amount. I mean, I get you're reinvesting it, but that's still, that's more than the $5,000 a month for sure. So, yeah. And you do this full time? Yeah. And how many hours is that, do you think, per week? Depends on my mood. <laughs> That's how I <laughs> answer. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm working, if I'm doing, you know, working hard, I do maybe 20 or 30 hours a week. And the reason for that is, and this is another reason why my income's not through the roof like I would have it probably. I don't want to sound cocky, but I have a, uh, an 18 month old kid that I just adore. And so working 20 hours a week and then being able to spend more time with him is more valuable to me than working 60 hours a week and having a million dollars in a day. And I don't know, to some people that might sound strange, but that's just where my priorities are at right now. So as long as I can maintain a comfortable income and work maybe 20 hours a week, that's where I'm happy if that's what I'm doing. 
I think that sounds amazing. I mean, it sounds like you have your priorities, at least in my opinion, completely in order. <laughs> you know, you're actually living life. You're working less, about half of what the average person works. Less, than, actually, they probably work more than 40 hours. And then you're bringing in all that money. That's that's awesome. That's great. That's total just maximization. <laughs> that's another word I just made. It's hard. It's been, it's been years getting to this point. It really has. And that's... I don't want to, that's one thing I want to throw out here, I don't want to just throw out the illusion that you're going to walk in, pop down maybe two, three thousand dollars in product, and next month you're going to be making five grand. You might, but you might not, too. You know, it's taken me a long time to get to this point, and like I said, I restructured entirely and basically started over. I had a paper, I had capital, but I basically started over back in August, and kind of redid everything, and I'm at where I'm at already. So it's not, it doesn't take long if you're buying correctly and if you have the money to buy the right product. Yeah, that's that's still great. I mean, that's not long at all that you've been working your new time. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Okay, so you, you do Amazon. And then, so what do you sell on Etsy? Um, actually, mostly product funnels. Um, like, for instance, I had this, I found these, um, I, I guess they're scrapbook stickers. I'm not very crappy, so I don't really know the terminology. But I was, I'm building a product, and so I had to go to Michael's. And while I was in Michael's, anytime I go to any store, I'm scanning. You know, it's just like a habit. And I walked down this one aisle, and they had these clearance uh, scrapbook stickers that say dad or, you know, daddy. It's all father-related type stuff. And so I just bought the entire lot, because they were 49 cents a pop. Mm. And what I'll probably do, because that seems like kind of a crafty site, is I'll put them together in like a Father's Day type deal, like a... a scrapbook Father's Day type kit, and I'll sell that bundle on Etsy, oh. because that's where the part of the buyers are. I could sell them, I probably might put them on Amazon as well, but I think that I'll do better with them on Etsy just because of the topic of the niche, you know what I mean? Totally. So do you feel like you have to sell differently on Etsy than you do on Amazon, like different pictures or different product descriptions and stuff, or is it still pretty much the same, you just put the products where you think they're going to sell better? The way that I use Etsy, it's pretty much the same because I don't sell um, like handmade goods. I mostly sell supplies. So if you know, if I was doing handmade goods, obviously that's a completely different world. I don't even have the first idea how the successful people are doing it. But for for supplies and stuff like that, you know, like tumbling beads, you know, when you're doing jewelry and you have the little rotator deal and you've got the stainless steel stuff in there to kind of polish the jewelry, I clean up on those. I buy them in lots, or I buy them in bulk, and I subdivide them and sell them out. That's like the supply that I sell on Etsy. That's, awesome. so that's the kind of stuff that I sell, and so really once I have my listing set up, I have an inventory of items that I sell, and then they go out. And how do you come up with your prices on Etsy? I don't market research really. I look around on, on Etsy for other people that are selling similar items, and I just price in the ballpark and see what hit. I just, for the first couple months, like if I just put a new product on the market, my price will go all over, all over the place until I find a sweet spot. Got it. So do you try to go lower than what other people are charging right away? Or no, it's either the same, higher. you go higher. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's counterintuitive because I don't, I mean, I'm not like doubling their price or anything like that, but especially like on Amazon, if you, a lot of people use repricers, so if you put your price lower than theirs, they'll just go pick, and then it's just a race to the bottom. And pretty soon it's like a penny, and you know nobody's making money. So I stick. What I'd like to do actually is I like to find items that are like that Amazon is selling, for instance, and I'll price it above what Amazon is pricing because Amazon reprices their inventory as well. And when Amazon goes out of stock, I'll hit the buy box and I'll sell out of my stuff in three or four days. Mm. I have to wait for Amazon to go out of stock, but it, it's kind of a sneaky way to get in there. That makes like, sense. It's like, it's similar mentality. If I don't trigger the auto repricer of competitors, then they don't ever, they don't ever destroy the market, is essentially what it fell down to. That's and really, if you're within a certain percentage on Amazon, they rotate the buyer box. I don't remember exactly what the percentage is, like 2% or five percent of the price and as long as you have good standing featured merchant merchant status that kind of stuff you get the buy box huh. 
That, that actually, um, I just was at Target and I bought, I've been in this habit of scanning everywhere I go now too, and I got this clearance, this whiskus um, cat food, it was like a special flavor that I guess got discontinued. And so I waited for Amazon to sell out, and oh my gosh, you can sell these little like. Did you? You must. Have, have you gotten them too? You're nodding. No, oh, no, I don't. But you're gonna have a bunch of competition now. <laughs> oh, I will. Yeah, I've already got it sent there. Don't touch it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But it was like I don't know, two dollars or something. And then the, on Amazon, you can get like thirty something dollars for each one because people love their cats, and it's like some special dairy flavor. I don't know. Just interesting. You can take it. That's actually a huge tip because when you can find a product that's going out of out of stock or not out of stock but being discontinued, you if you buy up the stock and you wait just a little bit, people that are hardcore followers of that product will pay just stupid amounts of money oh, for yeah. it. Oh yeah, I remember like lipsticks, special lipsticks that get discontinued. Oh my gosh, people throw so much money down on that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Health and beauty is a huge thing on Amazon as well. Oh yeah, totally. Um, was I gonna, okay, so when I was on your uh, website, I saw you had this whole thing about neckties. You were doing really well with neckties. <laughs> I do. I do. I don't sell as many as I used to because that was kind of an eBay thing for me, but um, neckties are a hidden little niche that not a lot, of, there's not a lot of competition and if you know what kind of neckties to look for, I love, like for instance, I love Brooks Brothers ties. And that's what kind of Hold me into it is because I found a good book for other side for myself, and I was like, I want to have a to sell for. And that's how, that's a lot of times that's how I find products is I'm buying something for myself and I'm like, huh. And then I found out, like I did some market research, I found out that selling ties in lots actually so you get more per tie when you sell them in lots than you do selling them one off, which is very opposite. And uh, so I just started going out and I. I Found you know ten or fifteen brands that I really like. I go out and I go through the ties and I find the brands, make sure there's no stains or spots or anything weird on them, and uh, bring them home, clean them up, take pictures, and sell them. That's cool. And, so and they're I'm small and they fit into like tiny little envelopes. They cost nothing to ship, you know. That's a really good point. Now it's different with like I know um, clothes and regular products that are in boxes and stuff. They're a little bit different because with the boxes, like you were saying, you can just send them. Amazon already has the stock photos and stuff. With the clothes, sometimes you have to come up with your own descriptions. Um, so I get. How would you? How do you do market research for the clothes? Like if you're at a store and you see, I know you know the brands of ties, but let's say you see a shirt that you think might sell well. How do you decide to buy it, or do you not touch clothes? Well, I don't do as many clothes as I used to, um, because it's not in my business model, it takes so much time. But, if you were inclined to do clothes, there are two things that I would recommend. Can I shout somebody out real quick? Please. Steve Rakin, from, uh, he's got a YouTube channel called Rakin Profit, um, and I'll send you the link so that you can kind of link people to it if you'd like. He's the man when it comes to selling clothes. And, uh, two, get the eBay app, and, type, like, for instance, when I'm looking for Brooks Brothers Ties, Brooks Brothers Ties, red and white stripes. And then I go through, I find something that looks similar, and I get, you know, a general feel of if they're selling or if they're not selling. And the way that I do that is, on the eBay app, you can, you can select completed listings, and then you can also select sold listings. So I'll do completed listings, and let's say there's a thousand completed listings, then I'll select sold listings, and let's say there's 700 sold listings. You know that 70% of red and white Brooks Brothers ties sell, because 700 out of those 1,000 sold. And so I kind of get a feel for the market that way, just as a quick general overview. And then I look through the sold listings to see general price point, and then decide where I want to buy it. That's so helpful. Thank you. I'm glad I asked that. That's great. <laughs> I I love selling clothes. I used to, I remember some of my um, I guess success stories where I got a furla bag for I don't know like five bucks and sold for hundreds on eBay, and then a Burberry coat I got once sold for eight hundred dollars. And it's just oh, like yeah. it's so fun. You go to these consignment shops for anyone listening that likes fashion and you know all the brands and stuff. A lot of the times at the thrift stores they don't know. And actually, it's funny, there's a, um, a thrift store a couple blocks away from here, and I used to, being that I used to work in retail, 
um, I have all this knowledge about how to best merchandise clothing and everything. And every time I pass, I'm like, you guys are losing money, you're losing money, you could do things so much better. <laughs> so I'm going to um, call them and see if I can just help. Like, I just, I want to take a couple days and just change up their inventory and help them. It's for charity anyway. <laughs> but I'm excited yeah, you also. You want for them? I just want to do it. It just drives me crazy. I know they could be making so much <laughs> more money. Um, so, but I'm excited to go through the clothes as I do it if they let me and then just see all the fucking amazing things that I'm probably going to find. <laughs> Uh-oh, you're going to have a full closet. I know. Oh, gosh, I already live in New York City and, oh, but, you know, space is another maximum here, but I digress. No um, doubt. <laughs> So, I'm curious, do you have any other cool little niches, like the ties that you do? Um, I, you know, I don't have any niches, per se, that, because I'm, I really will buy and sell anything that I can make money on. So, it's not like, like in the internet marketing space, everybody tells you to select a niche, get your niche, you know, create your following within that niche and stuff. Like that. And that works on eBay, too, like if you're selling physical products and stuff, it works great on eBay. On Amazon, it's the Wild West. I'll sell anything and everything that I can make profit on on Amazon because it just works. It's not... Amazon really holds their customers close. So you can't market to them, really. You can't, like, try and pull them from the Amazon sales process. So there's not really any point in creating a niche because there's not really any repeat business potential there. You know, unless you're really breaking Amazon terms of service. I know people who do. But, you know, like... For me, I'm just happy with Amazon doing the work and selling the product and me being pretty much hands off. So I don't really worry about it. I sell anything and everything on Amazon. That makes sense. And I guess this is definitely for the retail arbitrage model. Like if you went and you had your own stuff, like when you're selling the bundle and stuff, then you can email your customers and stuff if you want. Yeah. But those are so seasonal, it probably doesn't make sense to do. Well, you can do bundles that aren't seasonal as well, though. That's true. Uh, I mean, that's, that's one of the best ways to actually really set yourself apart on Amazon. A lot of people even will, and I don't know how I feel about it, it seems to be effective. I've never done it, but this is just what some people that I know are doing. Um, they'll take a product, and then they'll write an article, and that will be their bundle. And you can't copy it because you have the copyright to the article, you know? Like, if I wrote an article on, you know, let's say, uh, I don't know, I'm selling remote control and I write a, an article on how to program remote controls and get the most out of your remote. I put that together as a bundle on Amazon. I own the copyright to the article. Nobody else can copy that. So it completely eliminates competition. Whereas, if you just created a standard product bundle, you know, like a remote and a Samsung Galaxy, then uh, you, somebody else could go buy the remote and Samsung Galaxy and compete with you on that bundle. If they can find, figure out what your uh, user phone number is. That's well, actually, amazing. Just, you know, I didn't know you could. I didn't know you could even do that. I didn't know you could bundle like just intellectual property with an actual physical good. Or is it just like that you put it on a piece of paper and you send it, or what? Yeah, it's part. Uh, yeah, it's it printed out. Um, it, I like I said, I've never done it. I don't know all of the ins and outs of it, but I know that there's a lot of people doing it. Fascinating. Oh, this is so juicy. Like, you're giving <laughs> such great stuff. Thank you so much. This is awesome. Okay, so um, one of my last questions, I'm curious now, like, I know when you have the products from, let's say, um, Target or other places, and they're already on Amazon, you just send them to Amazon, and then Amazon puts them with all the other products like that, so you don't need to do necessarily any additional marketing, because people will just type in whatever the product is, they'll either buy yours or they'll buy one of them, but when you do the things like the bundles, what kind of additional marketing do you do? It depends on what it is. Like, for bundle, for, for instance, for a bundle that I'm going to, that's going to be an evergreen type product, I'll full out market it. And I'll write articles, I'll do videos on it. I'll even do, I'll send out a couple samples to, you know, I'll find people that make videos in that realm. I'll send out a couple samples to them, ask them to review it. I'll do, I mean, I'll market it. For smaller products like my holiday type stuff, really it doesn't take that long to get found in the Amazon search if you use the right word in your title, you know. And all that really is is just a little bit of free market research on what you, how you should title it, how you know what kind of search terms you should put in there and in your listing. And then it just takes time. 
and you, you have to make a few sales to get a seller rank. And it'll move you up on the search listing a little quicker. Otherwise, you're just going to sit down maybe three, four, or five pages in. It's going to be kind of hard to, to find. That's the tricky part about holiday bundling is getting your product to the, to the search results, the top of the search results fast. Now, I haven't quite gotten it down to a science yet, but I'll generally just what I'll do, I'll Pinterest it, you know, I'll pin it, and then I'll share it on my Facebook, and then I'll write an article on it, and I'll make a little video on it. And then that tends to get enough link views into it that it'll boost it up, get a couple sales, and then it starts climbing. That's a great, great tip. Thank you. So do you, um, I guess you probably try and pick your categories as tight as possible too, right? Like when you're listing the products? Yeah. So what I mean by that is basically whenever you upload something on Amazon, it'll ask you to put in whatever category something fits in. So it usually, I know for Kindle, it does better if you do instead of like pick general or something in a category, if you can get it as small as possible. So like Valentine's Day slash bundles that start with the letter L, whatever, like, I mean, like as yeah. specific as you can possibly make it, because then you get higher up and people that are searching for that specific thing will find you way easier. Exactly. Awesome. I feel like you've given so, I know you've given so much, I feel like I've completely picked your brain. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that you think people would be, like off the top of your head, that you think people would need to know or would benefit them to know? Um, well, if, if they're looking to do Amazon FBA, one thing, uh, just a little piece of advice, and nobody's going to want to actually hear this, but a little piece of advice that I'm going to give you is to read Amazon's, like, terms of service and stick to them, because they're so strict. And if you're going to be doing this you know, Amazon FBA business, it's not like a lot of other companies where you can get away with, you know, certain rules or whatever. They will straight up ban you. Mm -hmm. And once they ban you, you're blacklisted. So it is such a huge opportunity that it's worth putting in the extra effort to just follow the rules. Totally. I mean, it's such a, I know it's such a cliche tip, but it really is it's a huge tip. I have a couple friends that started their Amazon businesses, went astray. Both of them are banned now, and they can't, they're blacklisted. I mean, you can't get on them again unless you want to start a different LLC and like go through this for you big process. Uh, yeah. It's, it's tough to get reapproved approved once Amazon banned you. Uh, that's, that's interesting to know. I was um, banned momentarily from Kindle and I wrote to them and they were really nice about it. But I've heard it some horror stories from... Actually, that's the one thing that like, I'll never touch with FBA. I, had, I heard horror stories with like movies and music because the way that Amazon works with the co-mingling, you know this, I'm just saying for the um, people listening, but... Um, when you send in products to Amazon for fulfillment by Amazon, it's just going to go in the same pile with all the other ones of that same product. So um, someone had sent in some movies and music, and then someone, so someone went and ordered one of those movies, for example. Whoever was in the stock area picked up a movie, sent it to the customer. The movie turned out to be counterfeit, and they blamed the guy that had the most of the, the movies in the, where they pulled from. He didn't yep. have the counterfeit ones, but so I never want to touch like music or movies or anything like that because it's just. Ugh. You can actually opt out of doing commingled inventory, mm. and you, I mean you have to sit there and label every single item that you send into Amazon so that you have your own specific sticker on it. It's a bigger pain in the butt, but it does prevent situations like that. But I agree with you because there's so I mean, Amazon is not a perfect machine. I've had returns from customers and then have that return sent back to me so that I could inspect it and it's not my product. And I don't know if that's Amazon or if that's the customer. I don't know exactly where the ball is being dropped, but there's definitely fallout, you know, somewhere in the process. So it's not a foolproof system, but I don't, me personally, I don't do coming old inventory because you're exactly right. I don't want to, not even dealing with copyright or, you know, fakes or anything like that. I don't want to have my stuff thrown in with another seller who <laughs> maybe goes to a thrift store and finds a box that's all beat up and calls that new, and then that gets sent out as mine, and it's like, this isn't new. You know what I mean? Mm, totally. Well, most sellers are thinking when they're grading their products and things like that. So, I wonder. <laughs> I wonder that myself. Yeah, so it's, I don't know. I, I tend not to do the commingled inventory thing. That'd be another recommendation of mine.
<laughs> yeah, that's a great one. And so um, last question, I think, is um, I know that you've been doing this for a long time. Before we started, you, you had said that you remember we were talking back in 2005 or something when I gave you a course. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, I'm curious, you've done a bunch of different business models and stuff. Like why do you, why are you putting so much attention on this? Because it works. It works. Do you think it works better than for you, like the offline stuff that you've done or the internet marketing? For me, yeah. And I think, and that's not to say that the other stuff that I've tried doesn't work. It's just that it didn't work. I wasn't naturally inclined to really put my all into it. And that's where it ultimately failed for me. It's not necessarily that the technique didn't work or anything like that. It's just that maybe my heart wasn't in it. Or maybe, you know, it just wasn't interesting to me and I couldn't get off my butt and do something about it. Um, so this, it's, it changes every day. It's something interesting that I just do every day. And who the heck doesn't want to go shopping for a living? <laughs> I mean, really, you know, about the only drag in my business is packing everything into a box and sending it out to Amazon. Because once it's out to Amazon, they handle it, you know, the only thing that really I have to do is shop. And I love that. And keep books. I hate that too. Yeah. Oh, me, me too. Actually, real quick, and that reminded me, you said send it to Amazon. Now, do you do the um, discounted Amazon shipping? Because for everyone listening, Amazon offers you, when you ship them merchandise, they sh like very, very cheap shipping rates compared to what you would pay at the post office normally. So you do Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah. So cheap. I mean, I sent uh, I don't know, a 25 pound box to Amazon for $4 or something, $4.86. Yeah, it was some stupid low price. It was, I mean, it's a close fulfillment center, but that's how it is. It's like, I don't think my shipments per box are ever any more than like $12. Wow. How do you do that? Like, I haven't done that part yet of getting the cheap, the cheap disc. Where do you go in the FBA settings? Um, it's through your shipping workflow. So, once you label, or once you, uh, add all your products into your shipment, and then you go through the whole process. The very last page, you print your packing slips and you, you uh, print your postage. You tell them, okay, it's an 18 by 18, 18 by 18 box, and it weighs 32 pounds. And they say calculate rate, and it tells you what it is. That's so, and then you just print out the shipping label or something? Mm -hmm. Awesome. So you up and you stick the thing to the box and set it off. Oh, this is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. This yeah. has been beyond beyond phenomenal. I mean, you've given so much great stuff. I don't even know like, what my favorite takeaway is. There's the whole article thing that you were talking about. It's a bit of the ties, the liquidation. My mind is just spinning, and I know people are going to absolutely love this. So thank you so much. Good deal. And um, I know... Thanks for having me. Oh, it's totally my pleasure. This has been amazing. Um, and I know that you have you have your site, you have all your videos. You're not even selling anything yet, which I think is crazy. <laughs> all the information that you have is just so helpful for people. So can you tell people where they can learn more about you? Absolutely. You can find me on YouTube. My name is Resale Renegade on YouTube. My website is ResaleRenegade.com. Kind of makes sense that way. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, those are really the only two places. I have a Facebook thing, too. You can find that on YouTube. I... I don't really use it as much as I should, though. Um, so, I mean, like me on Facebook if you want. That would be cool. Awesome. So, yeah, I did, actually, can I, can I promote this real quick? Please. I did just post a video the other day, and I actually just sent something off my list last night um, for my holiday calendar. I have this holiday calendar that I set up. It has, like, all the different calendars, or all the different holidays throughout the year. And what it does is it lifts me way in advance. Like, it already alerted me for Easter. So then I start shopping for Easter so I can get stuff put out for Easter. You know what I mean? And so what I did is I made it available for people. If they sign up, they just, you know, name an email. And then when I get my alert, I send my alert out to them. And I tell them, you know, kind of what I'm thinking about selling and where I might be getting my products or what kind of products I'm doing. It's, it's not so much a this, this, and this are going to sell great, but it's just a brainstorm. It's like an open kind of thought process that I don't necessarily want to share with the whole world, a little bit more private with just my list members. But I did just post a video the other day um, that will link you to it, or you can go to resellrenegade.com slash cash calendar, I think it's cash hyphen calendar, and sign up there, and I'll send out videos. 
That's actually really helpful. That's a really good idea because I know so many times, like, it'll be February 1st and I'll be like, oh man, I should have capitalized on Valentine's Day, but now it's too late. So that's extremely helpful. That's a great idea. No problem, actually. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, President's Day is two days from now. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again for being You're here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me, Rachel. I appreciate it.